which is which actually just got published today morning right so jim benson is the main publisher i don't know how many of you know jim benson and uh, there are a bunch of contributors as well so it's right now out for kindle and the print version is coming out in april so if you go to amazon.to slash beyond agile that's the book um, and like i said before um, we also make products so this is some screenshots of our product so i came across this really nice quote by uh, david rocco a couple of days back so how many of you know david rocco uh, he's a cook he's a chef right? so i don't know how many of you watch uh, all those food shows on tv but he's got this italian show on uh, tv and he come to chennai uh, a few days back last week he shooting for a new show right and someone asked him in the uh, one of the reporters right in the press conference they asked him right, uh, you did italian food you did indian food and obviously both these countries have a lot of food culture in them and what do you think is the key ingredient in this food culture thing and so he kind of came up with this quote which i thought was uh, pretty neat so i put it in the last minute and he says that in all these countries where you have a big food culture right uh, recipes are not written down and formalized and everyone does everything the same way right but instead they get passed down people make their own changes and as time goes on you have many different uh, varieties of the same recipe the thing which you cook might be completely different from the way your neighbor cooks it and it can be completely different from the way uh, someone cooks it in another city the same dish right so if you take sambar in chennai it's a quite different from sambar in bangalore and even the one which my wife makes is different from the one which the neighbor makes right so there's no r right or wrong way of doing it there are like 50 or 100 different ways of doing it and they are all right and it's just people have developed that way of uh, matching the recipe to what they feel is their personal taste and what they feel suits uh, them the best so process is something similar to that you can't just go and say this is a process right and these are the steps and this is the one and only way to do it and many times we tend to search for that one true process that tell me that these are the steps and i'm just going to follow that exactly and that's the answer to my problems right but then in reality there's no such thing instead there are many different processes there are mix and matches of processes there are whole lot of things and the real skill is not in following a process but figuring out how to adapt it to what you want or what you need right so with that uh, what i'm going to describe now is not a kanban for startups right there's no such thing as this is the way to do anything but rather what i'm going to discuss is some of the things factors which influence what kind of process you start out with right so we are going to start out basically from the ground level and see what are the elements that we need to put in which uh, make the process work better right so with that uh, i just want to say something okay kanban for startups what do you think of kanban when i say kanban what do, what is it that comes to your head what do you think kanban is right anybody want to take a shot at it what do you feel when someone says kanban what is it sorry visual dashboard signaling sorry it's a methodology anything else okay a tool to manage your process so uh well this is kind of like a trick question because there is no right answer right it is all these it is signaling its visualization it is a methodology and it's all that it's so but what we are going to start off with i mean i guess the the visualization is the most
it's kind of uh, becoming popular and lean startup is built on this work of customer development which was done by a professor in the US of uh, many years ago and he's still doing it so the idea with customer development is we don't know what we want we don't know what we're going to build we don't know how the product is going to be in the final form right? so what we need to do is apart from product development which is making the product we also have to do customer development which is meeting with customers trying to figure out what they want having them use our prototypes and getting feedback and that kind of stuff so it's not that someone gives you a spec and you build the product that's not the way it works right and the second part is systems thinking so what kind of what ideas can we use from systems thinking to build into our process the way we develop it right? so the first part is that requirements are nothing but assumptions so in many uh, places requirements are like cast in stone right someone gives requirements we develop to the requirements so there's no discussion about whether those requirements are the right requirements or the wrong requirements or anything like that in if you are having a services startup it may be like your client gives you the requirements it says these are the things i want now your job is to just build that and, and in the case of when you're building your own product it may be like someone from the marketing side or maybe the one of the founders or whoever might or you yourself might decide that these are the requirements this is exactly what we want and then once you decide okay these are the requirements then the next step is to figure out how to build it right but the problem with that is in real life requirements are actually just assumptions they are not uh, some kind of uh, you know commandments that this is the way it's going to be not your problem so what you find is many times you build something and then find out that your requirements were wrong in the first place Like you thought that this is going to be the requirement, but actually it was something else. So you may decide while making a product that okay, we're going to charge monthly subscription fees. It's going to be cloud-based, etc., etc. But after you build your first prototype and you go and start talking to some customers, you might find that some of the customers say no, we want only yearly payments, and some of the customers will say hey, we don't want credit cards. We want to do a bank transfer to you directly. and some of the customers might say that we we don't uh, our company policy doesn't allow saas software it has to be installed in our own server inside our own network right so these kind of things can happen and they will happen and then what you thought was your initial requirement gets completely blown out of the water right so initially you might have thought we'll make a saas product charge monthly maybe you saw some other companies following the same model But then later on you find out that all those requirements were like wrong, and what you thought was the requirement is actually now changed, and you have to rebuild your product for something else. So the biggest mistake is assuming that your requirements are perfect, and then figuring out how do you build the requirements. Instead, you need to assume that your requirements are all assumptions, and the whole process is how do we verify. that they are doing the right thing right so there was a panel earlier in the morning where there was a discussion is a child only on building things right but not on building the right thing right so it's a similar concept where the biggest challenge is are we building the right thing that's the first step and then are we building it right okay so hmm. our first and most important thing is how do we validate these assumptions how do we know that customers wanted that they are going to pay for it and uh, that the, the target market we have decided wants it and while validating these assumptions we might find that some assumptions are true some assumptions are false some assumptions we may have to completely change and do it all over again right? so if you look at what we want to do is we come we have this opportunity which we think there's an opportunity there and we need to verify all the assumptions and then we will explore the opportunity so at this point we have got a product we have got we our software is built and it's having value for our customer 
But to get from here to there, we have to verify all these assumptions. Okay? And the total time taken from getting here to there is the total lead time of how long it's going to take for us to exploit this opportunity. And this whole thing itself can be broken down into stages. So if we have uh, 10 features or 15 features, right? each of those features is basically an assumption that the, uh, the customer wants it. We don't know. Right? Uh, so each time we deploy a feature and we make customers use it and we get their feedback, at that point we know whether that assumption for that feature is right or it's wrong or where we stand. Right? So till the user actually gets it, uses it and gives feedback, we don't know anything. We don't know whether we are going the right way at all. Okay? And the whole process is how can we make this cycle as fast as possible? Now how do we reduce this lead time? That's the key question. The faster we can get our features into the hands of a user and get feedback back, and feedback can be either in terms of people willing to pay for it or people actually just giving feedback. Until we can do that, how fast can we do that? How often can we do that? That is the key thing which determines whether we build the right thing and whether we build it right. Okay, so if you look at traditional software development like waterfall, you may have an idea, you make that into requirement spec. Right? The spec can be a huge spec. Then everyone develops it. And then finally, it goes into the hands of the customer and then they say whether they like it or they don't like it. And let's say it takes like one year to do this whole thing. So I decide on the product in January, by the time we do the spec, build it, etc., release it to the customer, and then they say, no, your idea, these parts of your idea are crap. By then it's taken already months or years and uh, that's too long a time. Or time frame. And I think uh, by now everyone agrees that this is not the way to do it. Okay. But when you look at uh, Agile, okay, a lot of Agile, if you look at Scrum for example, is building in two week sprints. Okay. So what are we doing in those two week sprints? We are taking some things from the backlog, we are building it, testing it, all that stuff. At the end of the sprint, we have a release which may, may or may not be deployed, right? So, but when you look at the bigger picture, what actually happens is something like this, right? So if you look at our end-to-end, -end, what needs to be done? So we've got some stuff here on new features. We've got development, we've got deployment, we've got to do marketing. You have to basically get users to use the stuff somehow, right, and get feedback. And only when we get feedback from the users, we know whether we are going in the right direction or not. And many teams do agile just for development, like this. Right? So this part is making a backlog. Then over here, all we are doing is splitting the backlog into sprints and building small, small pieces. But these pieces are not going into the hands of the users in many cases. Like they may be just kept internally, sometimes they may be deployed once in a while. And it, so all this is being batched up. We are not deploying each feature, we are not getting feedback on each feature as we build it. Right? So we are doing this iteratively, but then the whole thing batches up and we may end up marketing it only when the whole product is done or maybe like halfway through the product. So if you look at the lead time from the time you thought of the idea to the time when you get the feedback, it's still many months. Even though you're doing agile in the middle, you're doing two week sprints, but it's still many months before you actually get it into the hands of the customer in the end to end. Right? So the first thing is like how can we make the lead time of the end to end as fast as possible? So we're not talking just about development. We are talking from getting an idea till getting it into the hands of the user to getting feedback 
how can we make that as fast as possible? In other words, we want to look at the whole workflow, not just the development part of it, and ensure that we optimize the whole thing. Because just optimizing this part alone is not enough. Right? So, in order to do this, for example, we may come up with a strategy like, can we have in-house users who can use it and give feedback? Or can we have early access customers, like beta customers, to whom we can release incomplete product and get feedback? Like can, can I select, before even starting, can I shortlist from my target market, say five companies or five users, who are going to sit with every release and give feedback immediately? Right? So those are the kind of strategies we need to come across in order to shorten this whole end-to-end -end thing. So if you look at traditional uh, process, right? there are a lot of proxies in the middle. Like uh, suppose you are doing services, you are a startup doing services for someone else. Right? Your client may be like a business user in the client's company. So that person may not be the end user. That person is proxying for the end user. The end user may be someone else altogether. Right? So if someone is making, for example, a website for car owners and they have decided to outsource the product to you, so they are guessing what the car owners will want and you are guessing what they will want, right? So they are your product owners, they come up with some kind of backlog based on their assumptions and that is their assumption, right? Many times we treat it as if they know what they are doing, actually it's just their assumption. Right? And then we are taking that and making it or uh, trying to guess what their assumption is and trying to discuss on that. Right? So what happens is suppose I make a release to them after two weeks and you are making releases every two weeks to them but they are not releasing it to the car owners and getting their feedback back into the loop. Then what happens is something like this. All your releases to them are getting batched up and you are not getting the real feedback from the end user. Maybe like after you finish doing all your 10 sprints or whatever, they may decide, okay, now we are ready for launch. And then find out that, hey, you know, the car owners are saying that they, they don't want to pay this way or they want to do something else. And then uh, your feedback is coming too late. So at every step, we need to see whether we can cut the proxy in the middle, right? If we know what their target customers, can we get access to the end user, the actual user beforehand for giving feedback on this whole cycle? The second thing is on queues, right? So let's say you've got a backlog. Now typically what will happen is at the start of the project, you make a big backlog. These are all the features that I want, and then we start developing on it. But what happens if, let's say, you have a new feature which you want to put in and you have a queue like this, right? So a backlog is a queue. There, there are many types of queues, but backlog is one type of queue. Items in the backlog are just waiting. When you take stuff from the top of the backlog and you start executing on it, that's when you are actually being productive on that feature. Otherwise, that feature is just sitting in the backlog and it's waiting, right? Now let's assume I've got 10 features in the backlog. And assume all of them are similar, they all take one week, exactly one week to develop. Right? So this feature takes one week to develop. This fe second feature is waiting for one week while this one is being developed. And then it takes one week to develop. So it takes two weeks from the time we thought of the feature to the time when it's deployed. Right? So this tenth feature over here, which is at the back of the backlog, has spent nine weeks waiting while these nine features before get developed, and then one week actually getting developed. So if you look at the lead time, when we decided that we want to implement this feature, it's one day, and then when we got the feature in the product, it's ten weeks later, right? So out of the ten weeks, for developing this feature, nine weeks is spent waiting in the backlog. Only the actual time to make the feature is only one week. And, but the remaining nine weeks is just waiting around in the backlog. 
or in other words only 10% of the time is actual execution and the remaining 90% is waiting around in queues. Right? So queues can come in many places. So wherever you have queue, you have this kind of issue. Right? So the thing is we need to look at how can we eliminate queues as much as possible. Right? So if you look at productivity, right? let's say that uh, we can reduce the execution time for one of these features from one week to half a week. Then the overall <coughs> lead time for this feature becomes from 10 weeks to 9 and a half weeks. But if you can just cut the queue time, so that let's say in the backlog at any point of time only two features are there. Right? Only after I finish one feature, I can put another feature into the backlog. Assume that we work that way. We limit the length of the backlog. So we first finish one feature, then only the next feature can come in. Then what happens is that the queue time, maximum queue time for the last element in the backlog is just two weeks. And so we cut down the lead time just by cutting short the backlog. And that goes true for any queue. So So if you have a, a sequence like this, right? You have queues, 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 queues. All these queues. So this may be your backlog. Where just before you start developing. Now after you develop, there may be some batching before it goes to deployment. So you may have another queue there. And then maybe you have to deploy X number of features and then only your marketing is going to start marketing it or your sales is going to start selling it. So then you have another queue there. And similarly, you have queues here. Basically, wherever you have handouts, you will have a queue somewhere over there. And all these queues will end up eating into your lead time. So assume that each element spends, each feature spends like four weeks in a queue and one week in execution. So you will end up spending only five weeks making the feature. But then you are going to spend 20 weeks just waiting in queues. So if I decide on a new feature, it's going to take 25 weeks before it lands up in the hands of a customer. Out of the 25 weeks, only 5 weeks is actually working on the feature. The remaining time is just waiting around all over the place. So the best way to break queues is to prevent handoffs. Right? So I'll give an example here. So in one of uh, my previous uh, uh, company I was working previously, we had a situation where critical components need to be co-reviewed by a senior person. Okay. So once someone develops a feature, some, uh, some other senior guy has to co-review it and then only it goes into, the, uh, into testing. Only for certain critical components which have very complex logic and stuff. So what used to happen is someone would, uh, let's say someone's finished working on that and now it needs to be code review. But let's say the senior guy in that team is busy doing something else, like he's working on some other feature or for some reason he's not code reviewed. And he code reviews it only after one week. Okay. And the actual code review may take only one hour. The code review may not take a long time, it may take one hour. And then if there are any changes to be done, then it goes back to this guy and then it has to be co-reviewed again. So it may take another week again. It's a, here's a handoff situation. So the code review, which actually takes only one hour of work, will end up getting done only after one week because it's waiting for that person to become free to do the code review. Right? But Afterwards, we changed it such that anyone working on these critical components pairs with the senior developer. Right? So they sit together and work on it uh, concurrently. And if one of these features takes like a day to finish, right, and they are both sitting together and there is no code review needed, it can go into testing immediately. So previously what used to take one week before it can go into testing. 
or if there are some changes to be done, it may take two weeks before it goes to testing. Now, after one day, it immediately goes to testing because all the queue time, where it's just waiting, waiting for code review, the queue is eliminated. Right? So, pairing is one way of eliminating queues. Basically, how can we get rid of handoffs? Similarly, pairing with testers or or DevOps is basically getting operations and developers together so that you can make faster deployments. Okay. Um, Yeah, so when uh, you do a pair, there's no need to do a code review because the senior guy is sitting there and coding together. So it's already reviewed. It's the pairing is like a review at that time itself. So there's no need to do a separate review. It's like a continuous review happening during the development of that feature. And so when you do that, you don't need to do a code review. Is there uh, this pair is actually pair coaching you would call or is it pair programming? Because if the senior guy is only going to review the code and the other person is writing. Yeah, they work, work it together. together. Okay. They work it together. Okay. But uh, the idea is, uh, so you can do many things. Pairing is just one solution. Right? I'm not saying it's the solution. There are many other things you can do. The main thing is breaking the queue. Because if you didn't do pairing and let's say you did code reviews and let's say your company says every Monday we have code reviews and some guy finishes a feature Tuesday, it has to wait till next Monday before it gets reviewed. So for one week that thing is sitting in a queue, right? nothing is happening to that feature. So same way if I finish developing and it's waiting for testing and for some reason it takes uh, you know three weeks before the <coughs> test actually tested. For those three weeks, it's just sitting in the queue, right? And so it's the same concept throughout all these things. So will it not be the same case even in testing? Because once even say pairing happens and goes for the testing, and the other developer starts working on something else, then if there is something which is going to cause rework, then maybe is he going to put his existing task on hold? Uh, so exactly, okay. right? So, so from development to testing, if there's a handoff, you have the same problem. Right? So you are creating a queue over there. So let's say I develop something and it's not being tested and the tester will batch up four five features and test it. Then there's a queue being created over there. Uh, I'm not saying handoffs. Even if the tester picks it up immediately after the code review or when it is available <coughs> in the uh, source code system for testing. Yeah. Uh, are you suggesting that the tester and the developer work together and complete the testing so that it doesn't have any queue? Or what is it that you So that is one solution, right? If the tester and developer work together, it breaks the queue. Now whether that is a good idea or bad idea, it depends. It, it's generally it's a good idea. But in some cases, you may, it may not be possible. In a startup, generally there is no excuse for not doing it. Because in a, a lot of these things have to do with uh, the culture and uh, departments and a lot of things which are entrenched in big companies. But in startups, we have the opportunity to break all that. For a startup team, which is maybe 10 people, the tester is always sitting next to the developer. In 90% it's startups working in one office or two offices. You don't have like 100 people in many locations with their own departments and you have issues breaking the culture. So, in a startup, it's generally very easy for a tester and developer to pair. There are no cultural issues, there's no baggage on there. So, if it's possible, you should do it because it breaks the queue. If the developer and tester can sit together, all the better. Right? Same way, if you can get, I mentioned earlier about getting customers in. If you can get customers in before release, it's better. It breaks the queue time to the customer seeing it. Right? And all these queues end up creating uh, with work in progress. More queues, more whip. If you have a backlog with 10 items, it's a whip of 10. Like even though you you may be working on some. We are ca calculating whip from here to there. Right? So we are not just taking whip from started to finish. 
But with, from the time you thought of the idea till the time you see your customers, the right? concept to cash, that, that's what they say. So, um, to summarize that part, right? The main thing is how fast you can validate assumptions. Which means from the time I have an idea to the time it gets into a user's hand, get back feedback. Right? So that's the lead time. How can we shorten the lead time is the core idea which we are working on. And to decrease the lead time, we need to optimize across the value stream. Which means it's not enough only if development is agile, but then all the releases which you're making are not going into the hands of the end customer and you're not getting feedback. It's a, then it doesn't make much of a difference as far as the end-to-end -end lead time is concerned. So it's better to focus on making the whole value scheme a little better than to make a super optimized agile team and ignore the rest of the value scheme. And to decrease lead time, queue time is very important. Uh, the actual productivity in doing the work is actually usually just a fraction of how much time that item is just idling in queues. So if you can eliminate queues, you can cut the lead time by a big amount even with the same productivity, without changing the way you actually implement or you actually develop. And the less work in progress you have, the less lead time you have. So if you have a smaller backlog, that's one approach. The other approach is in many times, even in mission critical systems, it's actually possible to do it. Like for example, many trading systems have multiple deployments a day. Even though it's mission critical, it's high volume finance. So it can be done. But it's just a matter of the comfort level in doing it. There are companies who do it. So it's not it's not impossible. It's more of a psychological thing than a technical thing. Right. So uh, when we look at building the features, so we are going to build features one by one and get it into deployment. The two concepts which we are going to look at is minimum viable product, minimum marketable. So a minimum viable product is the minimum thing which you can release in order to start getting feedback. It, it may not be the whole product. It may not be the final product. It, so what it says is just build the smallest amount and so that you can start releasing it and getting the feedback. So two words, minimum and viable. Minimum means it has to be as small as possible. And viable means it should be viable. It cannot be just one feature which nobody can use. So for example, if I'm building an email system, let's say I'm building Gmail, the minimum viable is a person should be able to send mail and receive mail. Right? There are so many other features like HTML mails, attachments, filters, labels, blah, blah, blah. Those are not minimum. An email system is viable if I can send mail and receive mail. But if I do only send mail, it's not so viable if I can't receive. And if I can do only receive mail, it's not so viable if I can't send. So the idea is to implement that minimum viable. So if I'm making an email system, in my first print or my first two features which I'm going to implement are going to be uh, sending mail and receiving mail. At that point, I will start sending it out to my customers to start testing that functionality and getting their feedback while I build other things like Maybe the next thing I'll build is a login. In the first release, I may not even have a login. I might have my beta customers. I will tell them, this is your username and password. Use the system. right? I might, there may not be a way for a new user to register in the very first version. Because I know those guys. I will create the accounts manually for them and tell them you register and use the system and give me feedback. And because that's the core thing which I want to test. Then I might implement a few things like attachments, blah, blah, blah. And before going for a public launch, I might implement a registration feature. Right? So a registration feature, I might do it at the end. For the general public, they need a way to register. But if I have beta customers, they may not need a way to register. The second thing is minimum uh, marketable feature. So this again is a feature which is slightly higher than a user story concept. Right? So in the user story concept, it's very fine grained. So for example, let's say uh, I want a feature which will mark mails as important. If Google has this feature, Gmail, then it will mark mails as important. 
And there are actually three steps to this feature. One, one user story may be on my email list. I want to mark email as important. Another one may be that the user has a way to turn this feature on and off. And another user story may be that what algorithm I'm going to use for calculating this. Right? So I need all three user stories to do this feature. I cannot just go to the customer and say, I finished one user story. You can turn it on and off. But we still have not implemented the algorithm for this thing. It's useless. What is the user going to turn on and off when the actual algorithm is not there? And same way, uh, there's no use going to the feature custom and saying we have implemented the algorithm, but we have not yet deployed the story which shows on your email list which is important or not. And that's also useless. So there are user stories, but by itself, it's not something you can go to a user with. To go to the user, I need to have all three user stories done. And then I can say, OK, we implemented a feature for automatically classifying important mails. And then the user can test that and give you feedback. So this combination of three user stories is what we call as a minimum marketable feature. So generally, we are looking at, generally when we get an idea for a feature, it's usually a minimum marketable feature, which may have many user stories. So, so Quite clear about the defects you mentioned about minimum viable product and minimum marketable product. Because even so, if it is a minimum viable product, it needs to have those functionalities. Right. right. So a minimum market a uh, minimum marketable feature is one single feature. A minimum viable product is a combination of minimum marketable features for the initial release. Right. So initial sending email can be a, an MMF. Receiving email can be an MMF. Both of them may have many different user stories under it. And the combination of both is a MVP. Right? So first we build the MVP, and on top of that we build the MMFs. Right? So you get something like this. This may be the MVP, which is consisting of certain core MMFs. And on top of that, we add MMFs on top of it. Right? So your product is basically starting with the MVP, and then building more and more MMS on top of it. Right? And it's not just building more MMS, it may be also changing existing ones. Like the user may say this feature is useless, so you may remove it. Or they may say that I want this thing changed, so you may change it. And so the reason why we like our short backlog is many times you it's cyclical, right? Just because you release it, the user may say it's crap and then you may have to come back to the beginning and do something else. So when you have a short backlog, you can focus on getting these features right without worrying about having a big backlog over there. So, yeah. So uh, I, I kind of understood what you're trying to say. But then, you know, uh, the backlog by itself, you know, by allowing only a certain number of items to get into the um, you know, uh, work upon queue, mm -hmm. uh, but then this backlog is also piling up. We are really not avoiding a queue there. The product backlog or the roadmap is getting filed. Right. So the thing with the, the roadmap, right, is when there's so much uncertainty on the initial feature itself, mm -hmm. the roadmap, it's impossible to say where we're going to be six months down the line when we don't even know whether our first two features are right or not. Right. So if we are building an email client, we know that so many features are there. But we don't create a backlog of all the features. We just say, OK, our backlog has two features, two MMS. One is sending email, one is receiving email. First, we'll make those proper. So we deliver those, uh, get it into the hands of users, get the validation. Feedback, the validation. So Once that is validated, then we'll say, OK, what's the next thing which we can do? See, uh, even in a time box scrum model, you know, rather than this, even there, this is possible. Can actually do this validation of the first stop to items of the first two 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 items of the first optimize across the entire thing, not just about, about development alone. So it has to go into the hands of the users, and they have to do feedback and give it back. 
So yeah, sure, you can uh, do Scrum and make sure it lands in the hands of your user. Yeah, that's totally fine. But the concept of optimizing the whole value stream is one which comes from Kanban. It's a system thinking approach. Right? Whereas Scrum is more development. I would say rather in Kanban, this is more explicit. Exactly. It is more explicit. Right. So, like I said, right, there are many different ways of getting the same recipe, of doing the same recipe. The idea is we want to minimize the lead time. And that kind of uh, focus is more uh, of a Kanban focus. But it doesn't matter whether you call it Kanban or Scrum is not the point, right? So, yeah, you can do it in Scrum also if you start from this point of view. So, uh, if you look at it, so ideally we want to get our flow like this, right? Let's say we are working on four items at a time. We get an idea, we deploy it, we test it, and it's validated, right? Only uh, at the same time we are doing the same thing for four others. So we are working with four, group of four, right? Only after this thing is finished and validated, we decide, okay, what's the next idea we want to work on? And we work on it, deploy it, validate it. So the idea is to go from idea to validation, MMF by MMF, work. And this can happen in parallel. Right? So in Scrum, you are starting and ending time boxes. Whereas in Kanban, you don't. It's whenever this finishes, we just pick up the next one and do it. And the same thing here. So that's where you are kind of suggesting a come to fix with number here because you know, this, these three, four things together forms a marketable Yeah, so this is just an illustration, right? It's not that it has to be four or two or ten. It, the lower the better, right? At the same time, uh, you may want to do two, three things in parallel if you know that you can do two, three things in parallel. Okay? You may not want to put your whole team onto just one. Right? So you might do two, three. The idea is not, it shouldn't be too big. You shouldn't be programming many features without getting any kind of feedback back from the users. Okay. That's I was wondering, you mentioned about send mail, receive mail, and uh, switching on, switching off the algorithm. So all of them together really makes a full story. So I thought uh, the web can be uh, a way of looking at your web and thinking of how many will go together for a validation. Right, so each of these is one MMF, is how, well, so an MMF is a combination of stories. In the case of that uh, algorithm example, three stories make up that MMF. That, so stories are generally very fine grained, not necessary that uh, they are, groups are little, uh, MMF is little more high level. So we want to be flowing those MMFs too. Right? At the development point of view, that MMF may become three stories, get developed and so we, what we want to do is something like this, minimizing this end-to-end -end lead time as much as possible. So let's just talk about four topics quickly. Uh, so first is prioritization. So a lot of teams have this idea is we make a full backlog, prioritize it, and then uh, figure out uh, which is the top elements implemented, let's take the next one. So a better way that I feel is a better way is using selection. In other words, don't prioritize the backlog. Just know what is the next thing which you're going to work on. Apart from that, what order everything else is, is irrelevant. Right? So how do you select the next thing? So it could be there are many factors to uh, check on. One is, is it core? Like is it a differentiating feature? Maybe you're building a product. One feature may differentiate your product from your competitor, in which case that feature becomes very important, right? So you may want to do that in the early on to validate it and test it properly. Because if that thing doesn't work or you may need to do many iterations, usually that feature is something very innovative where you have to do a lot of iterations on it. Right? So second thing is risk. Risk is in terms of will customers want it? There's a question mark. Certain features you know that they want it. There's less risk. Some features or uh, some MMFs, we don't know. So there may be a risk of will people want it. So you may want to do that higher up so that you can test it early on. And same way, uh, this technical risk, 
which is do we have the technical knowledge to do this feature? So in case of algorithm, do we have the technical knowledge to actually write an algorithm like this, which will analyze and categorize the emails as important, right? So you may want to do that earlier to uh, verify that that thing you have the capability for it. The other thing is, uh, so there are many models for how do you select features. There's something called as Kano model. Uh, there's this uh, risk-based model, and uh, there's differentiators and stuff. But is it not prioritization again? Because you have one or more factors to prioritize it. One such is risk, one such is, uh, you know. So what we do is, instead of prioritizing the whole backlog, we just decide that it's assuming that we have all these features in a board. It's not prioritized. We just look at the board and say, this is the one which we are going to do next. So that is selection. Is this selection done by the team? No, I think it is a product team. Uh, it has to be done by someone. So I'm not going to get into who is the product owner, who is the team. Right? So I doesn't subscribe to the idea of the team. So, um, so we are talking at a concept level, right? You may have a separate product owner, or it may be a person in the team, or it can be anyone. Okay. But whoever understands the product, you can call that person a product owner if you want. Okay. So let's call that guy as a product owner. That guy who understands the product, understands the market. So the reason I'm being careful is in many cases, the product owner is just a proxy. Right? Or the product owner themselves don't understand the product or the market in many real life so I'm going to call that guy who knows where the product is going as the product owner. That person may serve. And may not be one person, it may be a group of people or whatever. Right? So someone decides, okay, this is the next most important. So we finish send mail, we finish receive mail, next let's make a login. Next let then we finish login, okay, next let's make this algorithm. So instead of prioritizing the whole thing, we just pick out the next. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is instead of having a list of ten you only have one at a time to work on. Yeah. So that's what you mean by selection. Like right. there are 10 things on the board, but for this, you are only saying, okay, until and unless this MF is complete, you don't have any priority for other things. Exactly. Yeah. And it may be one, two, three, yeah. whatever. But that's the idea. So the idea is because once you finish this MMF, based on the feedback, your what you think is important in the remaining may change. So there's no point prioritizing it, doing an MMF, then reprioritizing it, doing an MMF, reprioritizing it. Instead, we just pick out one which, whichever we want to do next. Okay, uh, when it comes to the development part of it, things will change. Things are going to change dramatically especially for startups where the requirements are highly volatile. It, whatever you thought was your initial requirement, at least 25-30% will be thrown out and changed. It's not just minor tweaks. You may completely change your subscription model, for example. You may completely decide that some features are useless, some features you want to do more. And so you have to plan for that change. So having a good uh, design is important. Having a changeable design is important because a uh, lot of parts of it are going to change a lot. And at the same time, you know, having some unit tests and stuff is, becomes important because when there's so much change happening, it has some amount of uh, check for the, the changes which you're making. Otherwise, uh, testing it becomes really difficult. Especially with a startup where you have few people and uh, if you want to minimize your uh, lead time, you can't really afford to do, you know, one week of manual testing and stuff. Testing generally shouldn't take more than a day or two per MMF. Otherwise, it's just too long as a lead time. Uh, the third one is uh, testing. So I just mentioned about testing. Now there are three parts to it: validation, stability, and lead time. Right? So right at the beginning, when you're trying to validate something. Uh, and this is purely my personal uh, thing, so it's slightly controversial, but I don't write tests right at the beginning because I don't even know whether I'm going to keep this. So it's more like a hack or a prototype, just for testing, just for validation. 
So if I want to uh, test a subscription model, will users pay monthly by credit card? I may build that without having unit tests. I mean, you will do manual tests, of course, but without unit tests. Because uh, after my test, I might find out that they don't want uh, this subscription model at all. Right? In which case, I might just throw the whole code again and uh, create a new one. So it's not really uh, for, you should be clear that this code I'm writing for testing a specific assumption. And for that code, as fast as I can test it, the better. I don't want to prove that that code is super stable, that it doesn't have bugs, all those things. And that comes later. So after you cross that part, comes the part about stability, where you know that this is something people want. At that time, I go and write lots of uh, tests, automated tests. Right? Because later on, there are going to be more changes in this uh, part because of uh, future stuff. and that So that unit test basically gives some amount of um, feedback, like when I'm making changes, I'm not breaking things. And uh, finally, uh, you come to lead time, which is how fast can I deploy? And the more unit tests and the more automated tests, like uh, even at the system or functional level, the faster you can deploy because you need to do less uh, manual testing. Right? So in, the, in an ideal case, uh, after a point, once a particular feature or area becomes more stable, you ramp up the amount of automated tests like a lot so that you don't have to spend more time testing that again and again for every release. Which means you can make your releases faster and your lead time becomes shorter overall. But will it not increase the queue time because you are going to accumulate all your unit test or automation speech frameworks. Till that time you are sure that this is what your customer wanted. Mm -hmm. So till those frameworks are available and uh, you are sure it is working fine, you are not going to deploy them in the production system. So the thing is, uh, in the beginning, right? So uh, we need to be uh, have an idea of what is a production system. Where, when you're starting with a new product, I'm talking mostly from a startup point of view. Uh, the initial part, you'll be working with beta customers who will know that it's not yet live. So they will know that it's incomplete. It may have bugs. It may not work exactly. And they are supposed to give feedback on whether it works well or not. So at that point of time, stability is not the issue, but validation is a bigger issue. Once you go live, so these guys are beta customers with whom you have an understanding already. So I mean, you may be my beta customer, I'll tell you, hey, my this thing doesn't work, but just check it out and tell me what you think, right? So if it crashes, you'll just tell me, hey, it crashes, it's no big deal. So that's the kind of thing. So. And, but then you say it crashed, but I really like the idea. So that validates. That may be what I'm looking for. <coughs> then we go into the stability part is, now let's say I open it out to some more people. And they are going to get really mad if it crashes. You may not get mad, right, because you know me, or we have some arrangement. So at that point of time, stability becomes important. Right? And I've already validated it with you. So I know that they want it. For them, validation is not the point, stability. So at that point, I need to have a lot of tests. And then when we go to lead time, is like, OK, I've opened it to the public and all that stuff. How do I reduce the lead time without crashing the system? At this point, bugs become a big problem. But at this point, bugs is less problem, and validation is a bigger problem. OK, and this is the final point, which is variable process. And Variable process means you do not have to implement every feature using the same process. For example, some feature like a login form is a commodity. Everyone knows what is a login form. It's the same old thing. Uh, you don't need a whole lot of validation on a login form. You don't need a whole lot of feedback on a login form. So a login form is something you can just code and uh, deploy right? without having to do a whole lot of feedback. But if it's a differentiator, for that feature, I may do a different process. I may get a usability guide to look at the feature. I, but I may not get a usability guide to look at the login form. I may get an early customer to look, use that. But I may not get an early customer to test my login form. Right? So uh, I may just follow a completely different process while working on a differentiator feature, 
Whereas when working on a commodity features, there is no reason that we have to follow the exact same steps for all the features. For different features, we can actually do and develop it in a different way. Right? So that is basically a variable process. And Kanban is a thing called class of service, which is basically uh, in deploy, implementing different features in different ways. Right? So if I have, for example, a production bug and my system is crashing, then I may expedite the whole thing. I may tell all the developers to like stop what they are working, fix this, and then get back to what they are working. Right? Because it is highly critical. Whereas for another feature, which is just another feature addition, I may not tell them you stop what you are working and work on this. Because it is not so critical as fixing the production work. So different things which you have to do, you can actually use different processes for them. There is no rule which says you have to do the same thing for every process. So that's. So finally, we come to the Kanban board, which is basically just a visualization on everything that we discussed right now. So if you have a Kanban board, which goes end to end from the beginning till done, and you can put work in progress limits to limit how much work is being done. Each of these yellow cards is an MMS, and uh, there's no reason that every card has to step through everything. Some may skip columns, some may go, depending on what kind of work it is. And you can use visualization by changing the color of cards for different types of items, like production issues, or differentiator features, commodity features, so that just by looking at colors, we know what is being released. And if we can make our process such that we can get through this line as fast as possible by cutting queues wherever we can. So for example, ready for death is a queue that's basically a backlog. This may be a queue. So where, where all can we cut these queues? Then we get a high lead time, fast lead time kind of uh, process. So that we can take any more questions regarding that. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, so the systems thinking part is uh, basically uh, things like uh, looking at the whole value stream, the whole process, and not just one part of it. Just optimizing one part of it doesn't impact the whole thing. In many cases, you have to look at the whole. That's one. The other thing in systems is the, this notion of queues. So many times when you have a full system with many queues in between, the concept of cutting down the queues and uh, to reduce the lead time across the entire system. Those are the ideas which we want to get through. It's also more of a lean thinking, right? Just in time. Yeah. So that's where you brought in that selection. Right. So selection is basically a form of that. So how do you use the manager working progress, especially when you have like, uh, multiple uh, yeah, so you use a board like this. But how do you make a decision at this QS to know as for like two the for another time? So you mean how do I choose the limit? Yeah. So that is as low as you want. The lower is generally better. You usually if you have like <coughs> uh, maybe like three developers or four developers, you may set this little less than that. Maybe two or three. Or sometimes you may set it to one or two more than the number of developers. It's basically experimentation. There's no scientific rule to get this. Uh, ideally, you want to go to single piece flow, which is getting one item through uh, the whole process. Of capacity. Yeah, it has to match the other.
So let's assume that translation is done by a third party, okay, who is outside the stack. Right. So you create the strings, you give it to them, they have to translate and give it back to you. Okay. So uh, what I would do is create a column and track all the strings which you are sending. The thing is, as more and more strings pile up in their batch, we put a limit on it. So we say only like, uh, say 10 strings. After that, you have to get the translation of the spend, then you send some more. Right? I'm just giving an example. It may be 50 or whatever. So, uh, what happens is, let's say you hit that limit. Then, now you may have one or two guys free because they are not. So, what happens is, once this limit is hit, once the development gets uh, uh, complete, like right, this is full, then right, it kind of starts piling back right, because something is blocked. So when it files back, so let's say these two cards are done and the developers are free and they can't take any more cards because it's already at limit. So you might tell them to like follow up with the translation guys to sometimes what happens is they may need some follow up, they may need some more. If you follow up, they may give you all these things the next day, for example. So you can use them to unclog the, the queue. It, that's one option. The other option is if you have someone in your team who knows some parts of it, so you don't want them to be doing translation, but then once they get blocked because of a, a, a bottleneck in translation and they become free, then they can start doing some translation. Let's say that guy was German, he can do all the German translations right now. So those kinds of things are possible by if you have multi skilled guys. You may not, they may not be very good at the secondary skill, but they may be good enough uh, at a time when they are blocked to do, do that. So the, uh, the advantage of doing this is, instead of them doing more and more development and making that queue go big, 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 they start unclogging the queue. So that's the concept. So, <laughs> yeah, the disadvantage of piling up is you may be just creating more web, right? And uh, for example, if you're just piling up and you're not finishing anything, what is happening is actually that let's just go back to translation, right? Let's say everything is piling up in translation. For that reason, you're not able to deploy it. You're not able to get feedback. In the meantime, you're working on many other features without getting feedback from these few features. And it may turn out that that feedback, when it comes, will say all those features you're working on need to be changed. So all that you, you thought you were doing productive work, but actually, it's it's right is what I'm actually yeah. So the idea is you can utilize free cycles in other places. The idea is uh, building up width can be problematic when change happens. Then you have to drop all that stuff. It becomes a big deal. So usually in most cases, so in some cases it's completely out of your control, right? In which case you just not put a whip on that, that uh, call. So like let's say translations have zero control, I can't do anything. Okay, just make it unlimited whip. I mean you don't have a choice, right? It's not your, your first choice. It's not an ideal situation, but you don't have a choice. Then you have to do that. But you have to keep in mind that uh, it's not a great thing, but I have to do it kind of thing. Is it also okay uh, to, to channel some of those free cycles towards some of the backlog items some other Yeah, you can. That's totally okay. And in some cases, you may have free cycles somewhere, which allows, for example, let's say that you have a feature you want to develop. You have two competing designs. You don't know which one is going to be better. You may use free cycles to develop both and test half your users with this, half your users with that. That's possible. Yeah. Formal. Right. Okay, thanks a lot.